Now, history teaches us that the supercontinent existed a long time ago, around 300 to 273 million years back. At that time, all the continents on Earth were buddies and hanging out together. They formed an amazing crew called Pangaea, or Pangaea if you're feeling fancy. The name comes from a Greek word which means all the Earth. Pangaea also had a massive water neighbor called Panthalassa. So our entire world was a huge piece of land surrounded by a huge piece of ocean. The mega continent looked like a giant sea, stretching between the tippy top and bottom of our planet. But as stories go, things change. About 200 million years ago, in the early Jurassic epoch, like dinosaur times, Pangaea decided to throw a breakaway party. Forget about the old ideas of continents just drifting around like big icebergs. It split up into smaller chunks, forming the continents we know today. Oh, and it created the Atlantic and Indian Oceans as a bonus. Pangaea's tale was first told by a German weather expert named Alfred Wegener in 1912. But how did he learn about something that happened so long ago? Imagine the Earth's core as a big, cozy fireplace, giving off heat. This heat creates special swirling currents in the Earth's outer shell. We can think of it as the Earth's crust, which looks like a big puzzle with many puzzle pieces. The hot currents make these puzzle pieces, called crustal plates, move around. Sometimes they push apart, sometimes they crash into each other, and sometimes they slide past one another. It's like a fantastic dance party that goes on beneath our feet. One day, Wegener looked at the shapes of the continents and thought that, hey, those coastlines of South America and Africa kind of fit together. And they really did. So he imagined that way back, all of the continents hung out together as one big landmass. But he couldn't just go and say that without any proof. So, how do we know Pangaea really was a thing? Well, there are some clues that brought us to this amazing discovery. One clue is like when you put a puzzle together and the pieces fit just right. Take a look at the shapes of today's continents. You'll notice that they could fit together almost like a perfect match. Obviously, their shapes changed over time. It happened millions of years ago, and since then, the shores of continents have been washed by waters for years. But even so, we can still see how well they fit together. Another clue comes from checking out fossils. We know that ancient animals left a lot of fossils behind. That's how we learned their history and what species there were. But when scientists compared fossils found on different continents, they found something interesting. These fossils look similar. Surprisingly, they belong to the same groups of animals, even though they were far apart. It's not like these animals could swim across the ocean on their four paws. And it's unlikely that this particular type of animal originated in two places at the same time. And finally, the mountains. Imagine exploring underwater and finding huge mountains in the oceans. These underwater ranges and deep trenches are like scars from when Earth's tectonic plates moved around. They serve as another proof that the continents are part of something bigger. When you look at these things together, you get a pretty clear picture. The Earth's continents were once huddled together in the supercontinent. They've since gone their separate ways. But the memories of their grand adventure are still written in the shapes of coastlines, the rocks they left behind, and many more. But it's obvious to us now. At the time of Wegener's discovery, there were different ideas flying around. Some folks thought that the continents sank down to make the oceans. But Wegener had a different take. He thought that the continents are always on the move. He even came up with a fancy phrase, continental drift, to explain it. Later, he was joined by another scientist named Alexander Dutoit. He added a little twist to the story, suggesting there were two original continents, Laurasia in the north and Gondwanda in the south. But the real party didn't start until the 1960s, when scientists figure out the secret ingredient in this recipe, plate tectonics. And finally, this theory explained everything Wegener and Dutoit talked about. Wegener's theory was proven correct after 50 years. As time passed, we learned more and more about our planet. We found out that the Earth used to have multiple supercontinents, 
Before Pangaea, there was a megacontinent called Rodinia around a billion years ago. And later on, Pinocchio joined the scene about 600 million years ago. What's interesting is that the continental drift story is far from over. Our continents are always on the move. Africa is giving Europe a friendly bump, and Australia is playing a game of bumper cars with Southeast Asia. You know what's on the horizon? Another supercontinent. So how will this next supercontinent come together? Well, there are four major possibilities. Novo Pangaea, Pangaea Ultima, Orica, and Amasia. These might sound like superhero names, but they're actually ways the puzzle pieces could fit. Let's look at them all. First, Novo Pangaea. You know how there's the Atlantic Ocean on one side and the Pacific Ocean on the other? Well, if these oceans keep doing what they're doing now, the Atlantic will keep opening up while the Pacific squeezes in. If that happens, the Americas, North and South America, will give each other a big high five. And Antarctica, that icy land way down south, will join the fun too. It'll be drifting northward. Next, Pangaea Ultima. In the future, the Atlantic Ocean might get tired of being so wide. It might decide to slow down and shrink a bit. The Americas and the northward drifting Antarctica will probably crash into Africa and Europe. And just like that, a brand new supercontinent forms. There are these spots where the ocean floor is sliding underneath the land. It's like a secret underwater passage. These spots are called subduction zones. So if these secret tunnels will be spreading and spreading all along the east coast of the Americas, the Americas, Europe, and Africa might come together again, and they'd form a supercontinent. This supercontinent would be surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. The next possible supercontinent is Orica. In this scenario, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans might decide to take a nap and close up. But don't worry, because when one door closes, another opens. In this case, a whole new ocean would pop up to replace them. Imagine a big crack in the ground cutting through Asia, like a zipper opening up. This crack is called the Pan-Asian Rift, and it would become a brand new ocean. With this new ocean comes a new supercontinent, Orica. Australia is currently drifting northwards, like it's trying to find a nice spot at the center of our planet. East Asia and the Americas might join in from both sides. After that, Europe and Africa might link up with the Americas, and boom, Orica. And finally, Amasia. It might form if some of the tectonic plates go north. They can take continents like Africa and Australia along for the ride. They'll be hanging out around the North Pole. All the continents except Antarctica might come together. And even though they might gather around the North Pole, they won't close off the oceans. The Atlantic and Pacific Oceans would still be open for business. How this grand reunion happens depends on the Earth's tectonic movements. So far, we believe that Novo Pangaea is the most likely scenario. It also depends on what exactly happened to Pangaea after it broke apart. And when the new supercontinent appears, what's going to happen with the weather? How will the ocean behave? And what about the animals and plants? These questions all light up our minds. Who knows? Maybe someday, our descendants will look at the world map and see this incredible journey come full circle. So keep asking curious questions and stay tuned for the next 100 million years. So the distance from New York to Lisbon on the other side of the Atlantic is well over 3,000 miles. At the average walking speed for a human, you could trek there in a month and a half. That's not counting the rest stops and much-needed sleep. Buying an airline ticket or boarding a ship aren't just better options, but the only travel possibilities right now. But if this long journey on foot became possible one day, would you be up for the challenge? The most obvious obstacle is all that water in the Atlantic Ocean. It covers around a fifth of the Earth's surface. All the oceans take up around 70% of our planet. When you open the tap or buy a bottle, you are drinking a tiny percentage of potable water. 97% of Earth's water is located in oceans. It's all salt water, and it's not drinkable. Add this 2% of water trapped in glaciers and ice sheets, 
and you get less than 1% of water that we actually drink. When you put these percentages into numbers, you'll need a long sheet of paper to write them all down. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that there are over 330 million cubic miles of water in the world. It's essential for sustaining all life forms, including humans. Oceans play a vital role in regulating air temperature around the globe. If they didn't have any water, the area around the equator would be scorched. This imaginary line that divides our planet in half runs through 13 countries in total, such as Brazil, Kenya, and Indonesia. The world's oceans are critical for our planet's water cycle. You know, like the one you learned about in school? It rains from the clouds and water eventually ends up in rivers that empty into the oceans. Then sunlight warms up this vast body of water, so it evaporates into the atmosphere to form new clouds. Then the cycle starts over. This process shapes the global climate. That's why, for example, the Mediterranean is so popular for the summer holidays. The region is temperate. If we take the oceans out of the equation, the water cycle stops. The area where they once sat would turn into a huge dust bowl. There would be dirt as far as the eye could see. Since there is no more evaporation, clouds won't form. Rain would become scarce. Humans would soon run out of sources of drinking water. The landscape of our planet would turn into a vast desert. Imagine a Sahara-like terrain stretching across the surface of our planet. Everything would become so dry that fires would break out easily. These are hardly the ideal conditions for a long trek between continents. But let's imagine you were able to survive all this. You start walking across the desert land that was once the Atlantic Ocean. What would that journey be like? You would encounter a landscape different from the one above the waterline. Everything below the waves is taller and deeper than the world we know. This is the land of extremes. Take, for example, the highest mountain on the planet. If you were thinking about the Himalayas and its tallest peak, Mount Everest, you are correct. Well, kind of. This mountain range is the highest when you measure it from the sea level just above 29,000 feet in height. But when you measure the height of the mountain from its base to the peak, then the Himalayas drop to second place. The highest mountain on Earth is actually Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's a dormant volcano. In the local language, its name translates as White Mountain. Nearly half of it lies under the waves of the Pacific Ocean. Its full height is close to a mile higher than Mount Everest at 33,500 feet. We can't appreciate its scale right now, but if the Pacific dried up, we would be able to stand at the base of this giant. The bottom of the Atlantic hides a similar mountain range. It's the largest geological feature on the planet. We can't see it because the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is almost completely submerged. It rises from the ocean floor to a height half of that of Mount Kilimanjaro. The width of the massive underwater range reaches one-tenth of Earth's diameter. The only visible sections of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge are islands such as Iceland and the Azores. The remotest inhabited island in the world also belongs to the visible part of this geoformation. Perhaps the only thing more impressive than its size is the date of the discovery of its ridge. Scientists charted it out in the 1950s. It's pretty recent when you consider our civilization is thousands of years old. This shows how little we know about what's hiding under the surface of our oceans. UNESCO estimates that humans have explored only 5% of Earth's oceans. It seems hard to believe, but more people have been to the moon than at the bottom of the ocean. The deepest place on our planet lies in the Mariana Trench. The discovery of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge revealed the secret behind the formation of continents and oceans. When you know the truth behind their origins, you'll know what to expect on your imaginary trek across the Atlantic. The ridge sits right between North America and Europe. But you need to think of these land masses not as continents, but as tectonic plates. These are huge chunks of Earth's outer layer. It's called a lithosphere, and it's mostly comprised of rock. There are around 15 to 20 such ginormous plates on our planet. They float on a layer of partially molten rock. Well, they don't actually float, but that's the term scientists use to best describe their instability. 
tectonic plates are constantly on the move. They can bump into each other. In this case, one plate goes down while the other one is lifted. This creates vast amounts of energy. On the surface, we get earthquakes and volcanoes. Tectonic forces gave our planet its familiar shape. That's how the Himalayas formed 40 to 50 million years ago. Around that time, the Indian plate shifted northward. It bumped into the southern part of the Eurasian plate. Since the two plates were composed of a similar type of rock, they each refused to go under the other. The only possible direction was up. This process is still not over. The range grows by a third of an inch every year. A similar thing is happening with the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It is widening at an annual rate of 1.5 inches. And there's an interesting side effect of this process. Do you remember the time when you were building sandcastles? In order to build the keep, you needed to dig up a lot of sand around it. As the castle grew in size, the hole around it became bigger. The same thing is happening in the Atlantic Ocean, but on a much larger scale. As the ridge is getting wider and wider, the two coasts are drifting away from each other. The North American plate and the Eurasian plate are moving apart. This means that your imaginary trip in a world without oceans might take longer. For every year you wait, you'll need to cover an extra inch. Now, that doesn't seem like much today, but give it some time, and you might not have to embark on a cross-continental journey after all. The continents will come to you. Now, evaporation is not the only way to drain an ocean. The coast on each side of an ocean might simply close in on it. This is what scientists believe will happen to the Pacific. Some 50 million years from now, give or take, you wouldn't be able to recognize the Earth's largest ocean. Experts ran a series of computer simulations to see where North and South America are headed. The answer is to the North Pole. This is where they'll merge with Asia in the distant future. The new supercontinent will completely change the shape and size of the Pacific Ocean. Geologists have a name ready for this landmass, Amasia. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.